All right, calculus two. All right, let's do this. Share my screen here. Okay, wanted to start with a in, an interesting example. Uh, and in particular, this example is kind of a classic. It has to do with basically a wheel, okay, uh, or a circle, if you will, of radius A, whatever units you happen to be dealing with, rolling along and us kind of watching a point on that circle trace out a curve, okay? So that is interesting indeed. And one thing that we want to do is, is actually parametrize this curve. And it might be surprising that that thing would even be possible to parametrize at all. But it turns out we can, which I think is really, really fascinating. So here's the picture. Okay? And this curve that we're going to trace out is called a cycloid. Okay. So again, as I already mentioned, this distance right here from the center of this circle down is A units, okay? And uh, what we want to do is somehow describe a point moving along on this curve. Okay? And we're just going to think about that together. Like how in the world would we describe this? Now, uh, I'm going to kind of foreshadow the end result here by simply saying that these are <laughs> the equations we're going to come up with. We're going to use theta as our parameter instead of t uh, because it more naturally fits it fits in with what we are talking about here. So we kind of imagine this circle starting out with the point right here on the origin, kind of at the bottom of the wheel. And at this point, I guess in the in the travel, uh, the basically that point has kind of made its way up to. Um, no, a second, sorry. That point has made its way up to right here, all right? Has made its way up to right here. And one thing that I would point out is that we can actually sort out uh, like how far this circle has rolled, okay? Because it's basically this distance from here to here Okay, let me kind of uh, mark off this point right here. That distance around the circle right there is exactly the same as the distance from that point over to here. See that? Okay. So in other words, uh, we've kind of sorted out how far this thing has rolled along right here. Okay. And what is what is that distance? What is that green distance? Well, it's a fraction of the total circumference of the circle. So what is the circle, circle circumference? Well, it's equal to two times pi times the radius. That would be one entire revolution, two times pi times A. Does that make sense? So how could I figure out how much of that we have actually um, how much of that we have actually gone around at this point, okay? Because remember, this distance around the circle so far is the same as this distance right here from the point O to the point D thus far in the rotation of this circle. Well, uh, this distance right here, okay, is going to be a fraction of the total circumference, okay? So that distance it's going to be a fraction of the total circumference. So what fraction is it? Well, so far I've gone theta units around, okay? Or theta radians around, right? So theta is the, the total number of radians that we have gone around, okay? And an entire revolution would have been two pi. You know what I mean, okay? So, theta revolutions versus two pi, which would have been the distance all the way around for one entire revolution. Okay, I need to take that fraction of the total circumference. So I take theta 
over two pi, that's the fraction of the total circumference we've traveled so far. And then I need to take that fraction of the total circumference, which is two pi a. And lo and behold, what happens to the two pi's? Well, they cancel. And what we are left with is theta times a, okay? So that distance from O to D as this thing is going along is theta A. So let me just kind of write that. This distance right here, let me uh, write it in red. This is theta A from here all the way over to here, okay? And now I want to somehow describe the coordinates of this point that are sitting right here, this point X, Y at this particular moment with theta kind of being our parameter that's gonna tell us uh, exactly where we are on this curve, okay? Um, of course, if we get to this point, which happens to be right here, okay? That at that point, the angle would have been 180 degrees or pi. So it kind of makes sense that the X coordinate would be pi A which that's exactly what theta would be at that point. And the y coordinate would be 2a because you would be two radiuses high at that point, one diameter or two radiuses all the way across. Okay, so what is that x coordinate right there? What is that x coordinate right there? Well, let's kind of, uh, let's think about that together, this x coordinate back here. And what is that y coordinate back there? Well, um, we're really going to have to we're really going to have to think about that together. Okay, so the key is that we need to determine these lengths right here. We need to determine this distance right here and this distance right here in this little right triangle. We need to determine this distance here down to this point. And remember, this is. This is a high, and we need to determine this, this distance right here. Because it's a theta, it's a theta all the way to this point D, but now I need to, I would need to go backwards by some distance, like this distance right here, to get back to where my x coordinate currently is. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, I know that this angle all the way to here is, is given by theta, okay? And therefore, what is, what is this angle right here? Let me kind of uh, make it a different color, like yellow. What's this angle right here? Okay, that, that angle that I just kind of highlighted in yellow right there. Well, if you think about it for a second, I have two parallel lines like this. I'm talking about this angle and this angle right here. And what's gonna be true about those two angles? Well, there's sort of a straight line that's kind of passing through right there. These two angles are going to add up to 180 degrees, okay? So I don't know, let me give a name to this angle that's sitting right here. I know that this is getting kind of complicated, but just bear with me. So if I call that angle right there, alpha, okay? And I know that this angle right here is given by theta. I know that alpha plus theta is equal to 180 degrees, which is pi, all right? So that means alpha is equal to pi minus theta. Okay, so, uh, what does that mean about this little triangle right here? Okay, so I, I wanna look at this, this little right triangle right here. Okay, what does that mean about that little right triangle right there? Well, let me just kind of redraw that triangle a little bit bigger over here, okay? So what we just figured out was that this angle right here is alpha, okay? This is a right angle right here. Okay, and what I want to do, and what we want to, what we want to figure out is what these two leg lengths are. This guy right here, and this guy right here. 
okay, because that will help us determine some stuff later on, okay? And what in the world are we gonna do? We have an angle, we wanna know these side lengths, we will use trigonometry. Okay, remember Sokatoa, okay, Sokatoa, Sokatoa, okay? So, uh, look, the sine, and incidentally, what, what is the, the length of this leg right here is, the, the length of the hypotenuse of this thing is A, because that's just a, a radius of the circle, after all, yeah? So using Sokotoa, I can say to myself, well, uh, look, if I wanted to find this length right here, I don't know, I'll call this one little x and I'll call this one little y, I know that sine of alpha is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, so x over a. Said another way, x is equal to a sine alpha. X is equal to a sine of alpha. So in other words, this length right here is simply given by a, a sine of alpha, sine of alpha. Okay, and what do you think is gonna be true about y? Well, same sort of thing, except instead of using sine, I'm gonna use cosine, all right? So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Please. Okay, so this, this right here is going to be a cosine of alpha, a cosine of alpha, okay? So a couple of things, I'm, I'm gonna write this down here. So what about like sine of alpha and cosine of alpha? Well, sine of alpha, after all, alpha is equal to pi minus theta. So this is sine of pi minus theta. Uh, and now, what am I gonna do? Well, there's this little thing called the uh, difference formula for sine and cosine, okay? So what is this gonna be? Sine of pi minus theta, I would go sine of the first, sine of pi, cosine of theta, okay, minus cosine of pi, sine, of theta. And then I have to remember some stuff. For instance, I remember that sine of pi is just zero. Okay. And what is cosine of pi equal to? Well, cosine of pi is negative one for crying out loud. Okay. So what I'm going to end up with here is uh, negative, neg negative, negative sine, which is just sine of theta. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So in other words, a sine of theta, which is up here, is really just, or a sine of alpha is really just the same thing as a sine of theta, okay, a sine of theta, okay? Now, what about cosine of alpha? Well, let me erase some stuff just so I can, you know, let me erase all this junk here. And uh, we'll look at what cosine of alpha is, okay? And what, what that gives us, okay? So what is cosine of alpha? Well, that is cosine of pi minus theta, which is cosine pi, cosine theta. In the cosine situation, it it's actually flips uh, flips the minus sign, it's going to be plus sine of pi sine of theta, right? Okay. So once again, what's cosine of pi? Well, cosine of pi is negative one. And what is sine of pi? Well, that is zero for crying out loud. Okay, and so what I end up with here is negative cosine of theta. So that way I'm no longer talking about this weird intermediate thing called alpha. I can talk about things in terms of theta. So if cosine of alpha is equal to minus cosine of theta, then up here, what do I have? I have minus a 
cosine of theta, okay? All right, so why is that helpful? Well, it's gonna be helpful, it's gonna be pretty helpful. We can actually determine just about everything. Now, let me erase some of this stuff and we will actually go to town here on this thing. So let me, let me erase this junk too. I don't think I need all of this anymore or most of it at least, okay? All right, so remember the radius was A. The distance from the beginning O all the way out to D was theta times the radius because it was essentially just the circumference of the entire circle, right? We'd already kind of talked about that, right? So this all the way around was the same as this all the way across, yes? Okay, and we just determined some particular lengths. Let's see if I can kind of write these things in. We determined this length right here, okay? What was that length? Well, that length is given by A sine of theta. Okay, A sine of theta, okay? So what is the X coordinate then? Well, the X coordinate of this point that's sitting right here is basically the entire length across, which is theta times A. And then I have to go backwards, right? I have to go backwards to get to X by A sine theta units, A sine theta units. So we get that X is equal to the entire distance from O to D, which is theta A, minus that uh, horizontal distance backwards, right? Minus a sine of theta, which by the way, if I factor out a, is just a times theta minus sine theta, which is exactly what we see right here. Amazing, okay? Now, secondarily, uh, what about this right here. Well, first of all, uh, I know that this distance, let me just kind of mark this in, in yellow or something. This distance up is obviously the same as this radius of the circle. So this is A again, okay, A. And then I have to add in that little blue distance right there. So what is that blue distance? Well, we just figure that out for crying out loud. Um, that was given by a cosine of alpha, which was which we uh, rewrote as negative a cosine of or theta, once we applied the difference formula for cosine. Okay, so this is negative a cosine of theta, and this time we basically add that length to a. And you might be saying, wait a minute, that has a minus sign. But remember, cosine of particular angles could be negative, right? And hence make that length positive, okay? So overall, what we see for Y is that Y is gonna be equal to, okay, it's, it's, the, it's that vertical distance of the radius, A, and then I have to add in negative A, right? I'm adding in negative A cosine of theta which by the way, if I just factor out A and stop horsing around with uh, you know, plus negative, just write it as minus, that's going to be A times one minus cosine of theta, which is also very interesting and is exactly what's written right there. Okay, hopefully that is a satisfying conclusion. And essentially all you do is you just you just let the angle theta go on forever. Once theta gets to two pi, you're going to complete one revolution of this thing. And then this thing periodically repeats itself thereafter, okay? So that's crazy, I think, and very satisfying that we can even write down an equation for this cycloid at all. But we can, and we just did. So, uh, so that's, that's definitely satisfying. Now you might be saying to yourself, why is this useful at all? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think it kind of speaks, its utility sort of speaks to itself. I mean, 
tracking the trajectory of a point on a rolling object seems like it might be useful. But it turns out there's a couple of uh, historical problems that were of very uh, prominent interest that the cycloid actually relates to. Uh, two of them are the, the tautochrone problem and the bacristochrone problem. The tautochrone problem was considered by Galileo and uh, has to do with pendulum swings. And what Galileo realized uh, was at, so, at some point he realized that the pendulum, did, it didn't really matter how far the swing was, whether it was a small, tiny swing of the pendulum or a big sweeping one. The amount of time that elapsed between cycles of the pendulum, whether the swing was big or small, was approximately the same. And he saw that as an interesting physical phenomenon, but also as a potential tool for things like keeping time and whatnot. Um, he wanted to construct a clock based on this tautochrone principle, okay? but he simply didn't have the mechanical ability to pull it off. Now, Christian uh, Huygens was the first to design and construct an actual working model clock. And he actually realized more specifically that the pendulum wasn't taking the exact same amount of time between swings, but it was pretty close. But what he did realize was that if you took a cycloid which is that curve we just came up with, and you flipped it upside down, and you kind of imagined a ball rolling back and forth, that one cycle of that ball rolling back and forth, kind of out and back, was the same whether the ball was rolling from a high point or a low point. Okay, so that's what was really going on. That's, that's where you got precise measurements. And Huygens was able to parlay that into some very uh, effective timekeeping mechanisms and, and also just uh, physical theory, okay? So this inverted uh, cycloid, I don't know if Huygens necessarily would have uh, immediately realized that it was a cycloid, but this had come up also in, the, um, in math history during the time of the Bernoulli brothers. Uh, so Bernoulli, uh, was interested in, well, there were several Bernoullis, but John Bernoulli in particular was interested in physical applications of mathematics. And this gave rise to the Bacristochrone problem. Now, brachis means short and chronos means time. And essentially, the idea for the Bacristochrone problem was trying to determine a, a curve where if I had a point A and a point B, so A was above B, a and B was kind of like to the right and below A. What is the path from A to B where if I rolled a ball down it, kind of neglecting friction and whatnot, would produce the quickest traversal from A to B, okay? Here's kind of a picture of what's going on. And it turns out that the solution is not just a straight line, but it's actually an inverted cycloid, okay? And what's amazing is that it traverses that distance from A to B in the shortest period of time. But also, if you started at some other point, somewhere down there, uh, below A, somewhere down the cycloid path, that the amount of time that it takes to get from that point C down to B is still the same as if the ball had started up at A again. Okay, so that's sort of an amazing fact. The cycloid makes an appearance as this brachistochrone curve. Okay, it's the curve that basically minimizes the amount of time that a ball would take to roll from, from A to B, okay, where I could take any curve at all that I want, including straight lines or what have you. And a cycloid is the thing that does the trick. It's fairly amazing. So the cycloid is related to the brachistochrone problem. It's also related to the tautochrone problem and pendulum swings. Um, so it shows up in a couple of very interesting physical applications. All right.
thought that would be an interesting way to start things. That's uh, an example that's given at the end of section two, and it will give us a nice foundation from which to work in future sections also. But let's talk about the next section, section three of chapter 10, where we start to put some of this parametric equation stuff into practice in calculus terms, okay? So in this section, we'll talk about the slope of a tangent line, okay, where that is brought about by um, thinking about a parametrized curve and thinking about derivatives of parametrized curves. And I won't talk about it in this lecture, but eventually we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about arc length of a curve and surface area of revolution using parametrized curves. So it turns out we can take these parametrized curves and do calculus in such a way that uh, we, can, we can revisit the arc length problem and the surface area problems, all right? So here is kind of the parametric form of the derivative. So again, we start off and uh, we have some kind of curve. And by the way, a smooth curve, all that means is that you don't have any like sharp points necessarily. Now, even the cycloid has a sharp point at, you know, eventually, but even if you have a couple of sharp points, maybe you could break it up into little sub curves that, that don't have sharp points, okay? X is a function of T and Y is a function of T, uh, where T is our parameter, okay? So like maybe X could be something like cosine of T and Y would be something like sine of T, for instance. Then the slope of the curve at the point X, Y, is, well, obviously it's dy dx, okay? But it turns out you say, well, what in the world? I don't, I don't have y solved in terms of x. I only have x and y solved in terms of t. Well, it turns out all you have to do is take the derivative with respect to y and divide that by the derivative with respect to t. It's like there's some kind of weird, uh, you know, cancellation happening with the dt's. Okay, so dy dx, which is the derivative of y with respect to x at the point x, y, is given by dy dt divided by dx dt. And again, uh, you know, x and y are both determined by whatever t happens to be, okay? Because they're both, uh, they're both functions of t, the parameter t, okay? So hopefully this little equation makes sense, dy dx, is equal to dy dt over dx dt. It's not that hard to prove this equation, but let's just kind of take it at face value and start working with it. So for instance, if I had something like x equal to cosine of t and y equal to sine of t, then what is dy dx? By the way, what, what kind of a curve will that give? Well, we've already seen that this gives the so-called the, the unit circle. That was the first example we did of a parametrized curve. Then dy dx, is equal to dy dt over dx dt. Okay, well, what is dy dt? Well, that's cosine of t divided by, okay, what is d, uh, so dy dt is cosine of t, dx dt is minus sine of t. Okay, and overall, if you think about it, because x is equal to cosine of t, and y is equal to sine of t, this is really the same thing as minus, minus what? Minus x over y. I could either write this in terms of t or in terms of x and y if I really wanted to. And you may or may not recall, okay, so x squared plus y squared equals one. That's the formula for the, uh, for the unit circle. You may or may not recall doing implicit differentiation, implicit differentiation, uh, in Calc 1 or in your calculus experience. And basically the way you did that is you, you thought of taking the derivative of both sides of the equation with respect to x, okay? And so what would you end up with? Well, the derivative of x squared is either, that's 2x. When you take the derivative of y squared though, you have to use the chain rule, okay? So it's gonna be plus, remember, so you think of y as being a function of x. This is plus 2y times what, times what? The derivative of y with respect to x. And of course, the derivative of one is just zero. And then when you solve this, 
for dy dx, so solve for dy dx, you would kind of move the 2x to the other side of the equation, which gives negative 2x. You would divide by 2y, and you would end up getting dy dx equals negative 2x over 2y, which is the same as negative x over y. Brilliant. That's exactly the same as what we just got using the parametric form of the derivative, negative x over y. So we kind of, we've kind of rediscovered the derivative formula without having to go through the medium of implicit differentiation. Once we have a parametrization, we can, we can sort of get the derivative that way. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. What about higher order derivatives? Well, uh, so if I want like the second derivative, oh, there's a, there's a typo right here. This should be dy over dx. So of course, the second derivative of y with respect to x is just the, the derivative of the derivative of y with respect to x. And then this becomes, this becomes your new y, basically, okay? And so you know that you really want, let me just kind of write up here. This is basically like d y, well, what is y? y is like dy dx, right? Uh, d x, basically. And you know that to get that, what you do if you're doing the parametric uh, derivative, it's going to be d dt, d that dt, right? So or you can write d dt of this dy dx over dx dt. Okay, d that thing dt over dx dt. Okay? And that's where this, this little formula is coming from. And there's no stopping you now. You can basically do third order derivatives and fourth order derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. You just keep applying the kind of parametric form of the, of the derivative by, say, by taking ddt of the previous guy upstairs and then dividing by dx dt, okay? So that's how higher order uh, parametric derivatives work. Let's look at this example, okay? Graph and find dy dx and d squared y dx squared for the curve given by these things. And we'll finish up the lecture by kind of going and looking at what this curve looks like. And I also want to look at what the, um, the cycloid looks like. But for right now, uh, let's, just, let's just straight up take the derivatives of this thing. So what is this curve, right? So what's this curve? What's this curve? Okay, no clue. Who knows? Who knows what's going on with this? But what's weird is we can actually find the derivative right now. So like, what is dy dx? Well, according to the parametric form of the derivative, this, this is going to be dy dt divided by dx dt. Okay, which what is dy dt? Well, that's uh, 3t squared minus, minus 3 over over what? Over the derivative of x with respect to t, which is 2t. Yeah? And uh, I don't know, let's maybe we could kind of break this up. That's the same thing as 3t squared over 2t, which is 3 halves t. When you think about it, because we can cancel a factor of t, minus 3 over 3 halves times 1 over t. Um, so maybe I'll write this as just three halves times t minus one over t. Okay, so there's the first derivative. The reason I, I spent so much time doing that is because we're going to have to take the second derivative also. Okay, well, uh, so d squared y dx squared, you know that that's going to be d Right, the formula says I need to take d dt of the first derivative. Okay, and dy dx is actually a function of, of t that we just came up with, right? And then I take dx dt down here again, okay? So what is the second derivative 
going to be? Well, it's going to be, okay, so I have to take the derivative with respect to t of the first derivative. All right, well, I can kind of see how that's gonna go. It's gonna be three halves, three halves what? Uh, uh, right, so that just comes along for the right. It's gonna be one, and think about, so one, and if you think about one over t as t to the minus one, the minus one comes down and makes that a plus. t to the minus two, so one plus what? One over t squared, essentially, okay? And what's gonna be downstairs? Well, I just have to divide by dx dt, which is two t, okay? And I'll just kind of, I'll kind of leave, uh, leave the second derivative in that form. Um, we'll probably utilize this in the next lecture, but I just wanted to give you uh, some practice with computing these derivatives and higher derivatives with a specific example like this one. But the question is, what is this curve? What does this curve actually look like? Okay, and uh, I at least wanna finish the lecture by looking at it visually, and then we'll pick up next time and uh, next time we meet, which is on Monday, and we'll actually look more explicitly at, at how to come up with, with this curve without using, um, without using Desmos, okay? So let's go over into Desmos and see what this thing looks like. All right, so what I've done here is I've actually put in that parametrized curve into Desmos, okay? So the red curve, uh, so X is T squared, right? So remember, we had x equal to t squared, and we had y equal to t cubed minus 3t, right? Okay, and we had negative 2 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 2. And if you put that into Desmos, you get this cool looking fish shape right here, right? So, I mean, who knows where that comes from? And actually here, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll let the, I'll let the uh, thing get traversed like if, and you can kind of think about this by plugging in various values of t, uh, like negative two and zero and, and two, or and like negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, and you would be able to get an orientation. But it's fairly evident that what's happening is this thing is kind of flowing in this direction. So hang on, uh, you know, it starts off down here. It goes like this. comes up like this. And what's interesting about this curve is there's actually a point of intersection right there. And uh, next time I wanna do a little bit of work to, to try to tease out one, what does this curve actually look like? How do we come up with this? Because one of the, one of the uh, questions in that example we just did was to graph this thing. We did, but we used Desmos, right? So I could make a table of values and actually graph this thing, you know, and get a rough idea but I would like to do that with a little bit more precision. And so we're gonna to wanna to do that. And also I wanna discern where points like this, like this crossing point actually are occurring. Like for what values of the parameter is that happening? And we'll be able to completely accurately determine that. Okay, so I just wanna give you some algebraic skills uh, to that end, but that's not this lecture. That will be next lecture. Look at that, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool looking right there. And finally, I wanted to illustrate the cycloid in at least one case. Here I've, I've kind of created a cycloid of radius two. So that is, it, it, it's coming from a wheel, a rolling wheel of radius two, which means the point on the wheel, the highest point will be four, okay? And then I basically used, I used U instead of theta just because uh, Desmos doesn't like theta. And uh, I just wanted to show you what this looks like. So there's the point, it's starting right here and we're gonna see this thing kind of go through a few cycles. I went from zero to six pi in this parameter right here in the parameter U. So let's watch this thing kind of traverse along the cycloid path, right? Remember we actually came up with this parametrization, yeah? Okay, so you can see that the maximum height is about four Okay, and that one revolution, let's see, one revolution of the circle puts us around like 13. Uh, if you think about that for a minute, uh, you know, that should be two pi times the radius, 
when we do one revolution, two pi times pi is four pi, okay? And what is four pi? Well, uh, that's about, you know, 12.56 or so, right? So that makes sense that that thing would kind of come to rest from zero, go do one, one revolution and come to rest around uh, somewhere between 12 and 13, 12 and a half or so, which is exactly what's happening. And here's like what the full curve itself looks like. I used T here, uh, it seems to really want to give me the option of the full range. So you can see the whole curve at the, at the same time that the point is moving. Okay, so there it is right there. There's the cycloid of radius two, the point moving along there. We see that the maximum is reached uh, halfway through the cycle. Um, and uh, that's a height of four and one revolution is reached and uh, the, the wheel has rolled a distance of 12.56 approximately, which is two times two pi, right? Two pi times the radius of two, okay? I think that's pretty exciting. That's all for now. We'll do some calculus with this later on and we'll revisit this example and uh, the example that, the cycloid example and the example we just did prior to this uh, to really see what's going on calculus wise with some things. All right, um, see you on Monday.